questo simposio, come avrete evinto dal titolo Sensory Ecology, si focalizza su un tema che l'artista sente come particolarmente urgente, e cioè come conciliare la nostra esperienza e vita sensoriale in relazione a un mondo che tende sempre più a frammentare e a canalizzare le nostre esperienze attraverso la tecnologia, in particolare, ma non solo, la tecnologia digitale. Ma anche un'altra domanda che si pone è come rendere la tecnologia più vicina al nostro essere sensoriale ed emozionale quotidiano, cioè come provare a immaginare un futuro in cui vita e tecnologia, esperienza sensoriale e digitale non siano in contraddizione o addirittura peggio in competizione, ma lavorino in collaborazione, in incontro. Un tema che, per chi ha visto la mostra o la vedrà, è centrale ed espresso in molte di queste opere. Um, per rispondere in modi molto diversi a queste domande abbiamo con noi delle persone davvero straordinarie, un panel molto diverso di persone sia dal punto di vista uh, delle loro discipline, delle loro pratiche, sia dal punto di vista geografico. Abbiamo persone uh, che vengono dal, dalla Gran Bretagna, dalla Svizzera a Spagna, dall'Italia, uh, dagli Stati Uniti, dalla California e eh, molte di loro saranno con noi in forma digitale, una forma che ormai è molto contemporanea per motivi o contingenti o geografici e alcune di loro, in particolare oltre, oltre ad Anica, Monica Beio e Jane Calvert sono qui con noi invece fisicamente. Um, dicevo, queste, queste persone che lavorano in campi veramente lontani ed è bellissimo che tutte abbiano accettato con grande entusiasmo questo incontro, anche e soprattutto spinte proprio dalla possibilità di incontrare professionisti, studiosi così diversi, persone che lavorano, dicevo, eh, dalla robotica alla biologia sintetica, dall'arte alla poesia, dalla ricerca olfattiva al design sostenibile. E tutte persone il cui lavoro eh, pone al centro obiettivi che sono obiettivi ampi, obiettivi soprattutto a lungo termine, che per quanto possibile poi nella, ovviamente nelle necessità professionali di ognuno riescono a sottrarsi a quella pressante richiesta del tutto e subito, dell'obiettivo, del risultato a breve termine, no? per, per spostare lo sguardo su un obiettivo più, più ampio e che necessariamente è più incerto per definizione quando spostiamo lo sguardo in alto, quando spostiamo lo sguardo lontano ci muoviamo nel territorio dell'incertezza dove si esplorano però e dove è possibile ragionare e aprirsi su questioni che sono profonde, rilevanti per il nostro futuro, per quello delle altre specie viventi e per quello del nostro intero mondo. Eh, prima di lasciare la parola ad Anika I voglio ringraziare i nostri ospiti che poi presenteremo nel dettaglio prima dei loro interventi. Eh, Monica Beio, dicevo, Barbara Mazzolai, Eric Larenbeck, Jane Calvert, Harmony Holiday e Swan Su. Poi vorrei ringraziare moltissimo davvero Fiammetta Griccioli e Vicente Todolì, vorrei ringraziare moltissimo Arianna Bertolo, la nostra producer che ci ha accompagnato in questo percorso, vorrei ringraziare tantissimo i miei colleghi eh, di tutti gli uffici che ovviamente come sempre partecipano in maniera molto intensa a questi progetti, vorrei ringraziare ovviamente Pirelli che rende possibile non solo le straordinarie mostre ma anche tutte queste fondamentali per noi attività collaterali, educative e di engagement del pubblico. Um, dal punto di vista pratico uh, ci tengo a dire che alla fine di ogni intervento sarete invitati, chiamati a, a fare delle domande ai singoli relatori e che alla fine del, del percorso potremo vedere insieme The Flavor Genome, un bellissimo film originariamente eh, girato in 3D e che Anica di solito permette di vedere installato in 3D, ma che in via del tutto davvero eccezionale ci permette oggi di vedere in una sua versione 2D perché ha dei temi che sono veramente rilevanti per quello che è eh, l'argomento di oggi. Uh, vi ricordo che esiste la possibilità di avere il testo del film tradotto in italiano che vi accompagnerà durante questa visione. Grazie a tutti e invito Anica sul palco. Uh, 
I want to thank everyone at the Hangar Bicoca for hosting us for this uh, auspicious symposium. And of course, all the intrepid guests um, of, uh, of the symposium. And uh, I'll try to keep this brief, but I wanted to do something of the impossible, which is sort of addressing the bio and the technosphere, which is increasingly where my work is expanding to. Um, and I will try to make a little sense of it here. Uh, for years, I've been describing my experience of what I call ocular fatigue. In our globalized contemporary culture, everything seems overly dominated by the ocular sense. Sorry, I'm not very good at this, <laughs> advancing these slides, okay. The ocular sense. Everything is about looking and looking at screens in particular. Yet when I go online, I often find that I'm not even looking anymore because I encounter such an overwhelming proliferation of images. We have so much information technology available to us, yet I often feel that we're not fully perceiving what we encounter. I relate this feeling to what philosopher Byung-Shul Han calls serial perception, the constant registering of the new, which has no chance to linger before it is immediately replaced. This tumult of information rushes us from one experience to the next, from one sensation to the next, without ever coming to closure. Sorry, I keep doing this. <laughs> Furthermore, it seems that our contemporary technologies disrupt our empathic core because they focus primarily on sight and sound while neglecting our other senses, like smell, touch, and taste. In Western culture, the immediacy of air and odor molecules has contributed to the disparaged status of our olfactory sense. Kant positions smell as aesthetically inferior to the other senses due to its intimate and involuntary nature. He argued that such intimate sensations between object and subject could only be judged as agreeable or disagreeable and had no place in the realm of higher aesthetic discernment. The senses of sight and sound, on the other hand, create an illusion of autonomy and objective distance, detached and hygienic non-interaction. Scent then becomes a residue of the abject, a reminder of our enmeshed metabolism with nature and even greater the cosmos. My recent work at the Tate Modern, In Love with the World, explored this recent bi sensory bias, which I called the biopolitics of the senses, by asking how we might enrich our technologies with their own sensorium and artificial physical intelligence, such as olfaction. Rather than denigrating the sense of smell, it inspires in me a deep sense of wonder. The molecules in the air we breathe and smell are like symbiotic pearls that connect us to a central biomass and all living organisms on Earth. These individual molecules are constantly rearranged and recycled through biochemical and geochemical processes. In essence, we are breathing molecules from prehistoric times, as well as converting molecules for a future timeline. When I created the machine species that I call aerobes, I wanted to connect them with this expansive legacy of ancient air. My concept of biologized machines is ultimately about endowing our technologies with the necessary biological tools to evolve on their own. I welcome the aerobes into the world, not as servants or adversaries, but as a new type of kin, a companion species. So when I stopped to contemplate the coming wave of new decentralized and spatialized technologies, I am concerned that we are still focusing almost exclusively on sight and sound. Immersive technologies such as augmented reality and virtual reality devices are defined as those devices that bridge our connection to a multi-sensory and material world. However, for the most part, the technologies in development still only engage two of our senses. 
These devices are becoming more and more refined at replicating and transporting us, illusionistically through a fantastical yet sensorially impoverished world. Because they can be rep replicated solely through light and vibration, sight and sound are more easily ported through our digital technologies. In contrast, olfaction requires direct chemical interaction between the subject who is doing the smelling and the ingested material, the smell molecules. These molecules enter our bodies and transform us in a more immediate way rather than either the light rays related to sight or the sound waves related to hearing. We feel more vulnerable in connection to our sense of smell because we know that what we are smelling is actively permeating our body and having other metabolic effects such as intoxication, salivation, and arousal. We can see and hear from a distance, but when we smell, it means we have already absorbed the molecules that cause the sensation. Smell confronts us with the relational and permeable nature of our existence. As I reflect on my film, The Flavor Genome, I'm struck by the way smell was framed, almost like a type of virtual reality. In The Flavor Genome, one of the characters is an elusive animal-plant hybrid called the Saudade Hiza. Saudade in Portuguese refers to a sad state of intense longing for someone or something that is absent and may never return, a melancholic yearning in the Brazilian temperament. In the film, when the saudade flower is pollinated by a wasp, it sets into motion a cascade of biochemical disturbances from releasing swarms of pathogenic bacteria to activating the fungal internet to ensnaring and digesting human bodies in its vicinity. The molecular cocktail secreted by the saudade's petals is so powerful that it can be used to create chemical personas these are aromas so overwhelming that they cause a hallucinogenic experience of being out of one's body, slipping instead into the body and experience the subjectivity of another. Imagine if you could taste a multitude of chemical personas. The narrator asks us, what if you could momentarily inhabit the mind of a cannibal or a hormonal teenager? This would be the ultimate form of shared experience and truly embodied virtual reality, a chemically imbibed form of empathy. However ambiguous ethical status of the narrators implies a critique of technologies that aspire to more holistically give us this embodied experience of others. Leaving a trail of bodies in its wake, the film questions what the hidden costs of this economy might be. While fully sensorial virtual reality could lead to new forms of empathy, incorporating the sensorium into our current precarious and opaque digital platforms could also mean the deployment of the senses to further exploitative capitalist ends. The utopian prediction of new crypto technologies is that they will transform the internet as we know it upending traditional centers of wealth and power and rushing in a new middleman-free digital economy. The dystopian version would bring about a pay-to-play version of the internet in which every activity and social interaction becomes a financial interaction. Software engineer and outspoken critic of crypto technologies, Stephen Deal has ominously described Web3 as the hyper-financialization of all human existence. Beyond these extremes, we can perceive that increasing decentralized digital communication will mean local intensity give ways, give, gives way to more fractured extensivity. Digital communication does not necessarily establish relationships, only connections. In late capitalist extractive terms, we generally regard the body as a source for exploitation and labor, or what artist Oran Katz has termed the outsourcing of suffering. 
So naturally, as we layer more technologies onto the subjugated body and create further connections to non-human machines we regard as tools, this leaves many of us vulnerable to abuse and destruction of our bodies. In contrast, there seems to be evidence in non-capitalist civilizations of more appreciative relationships to the body. Resonating with some of my thoughts from In Love with the World, several indigenous scholars, such as Jason Edward Lewis, are beginning to contemplate machines in more convivial terms, as potential kin rather than simply tools. Can we endow our technologies with physical intelligence and share the world in a more compassionate way with our machines? Regarding the body under capitalism, it seems we are attempting to optimize its performance through the consumption of endless information. I believe we have betrayed the body to the point of denying its framework, even contemplating complete departure from the biological body via technological surrogate. Where is there space and time to regenerate the body in this exhaustive system? I believe that building decentralized platforms might lead to more fracturing. On the other hand, these platforms could be built in truly diverse ways that foster community, accommodate fully sensing and diverse bodies, and recognize non-human agency from beings such as microbes and machines. Amidst this fractured technosphere, the sensorium can offer us a renewed sense of universality and cohesion. The shared sensory experience we have gives us connection to an objective world beyond our devices and individual subjective consciousness. Sensory experience is translational and communicable. Dogs, for instance, have a much more developed sense of smell, yet they can intimately relate to us humans who must rely more heavily on our eyesight. Nearly all living things, even the smallest microorganisms, are united by some form of chemoreception or sense of smell. In order to build strong communities that can respond to a rapidly evolving and decentralized technosphere, I believe we need to break up the rigid distinctions between disciplines that we experience as a hangover from modernism. We need to be more fluid and multifaceted in order to work collectively on the existentially urgent issues of our time. As evidenced by the interdisciplinary panel that we have for this evening, we need not stay in our intellectual lanes. Scientists, engineers, and anthropologists use similar and complementary methodologies of creativity as artists. Artists similar to me have hard, have hard science backgrounds and rely heavily on research that informs their artistic practice. My goal is to synthesize meaning, purpose, and fulfillment towards a communal becoming. The time to enter the conversation is now. While these new technological terrains offer opportunities for us to redirect our webs of relational relationality, together we can surf and float, ventilate and guide the societal flow in a different direction towards building embodied connections and community with others. I believe there is still some chance to do this while these technologies are in a nascent stage and before wealth and power once again become ossified. Thank you.